Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Ian Morris, who is the Jean and Rebecca Willard Professor of Classics and Professor of History at Stanford University. Uh, he is also director of Stanford's archaeological excavation at Monte Polizzo, Sicily. He has published 10 books and more than 80 articles on archaeology and history. His new book is Why the West Rules for Now, The Patterns of History and What They Re Reveal About the Future. Ian, welcome to Berkeley. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me here. Where were you born and raised? I was born in Stoke-on-Trent, which is uh, right in the center of England. And looking back, how do you think your parents shaped your thinking about the world? Um, all, all kinds of ways. I mean, neither of them was an academic. In fact, neither of them had even finished high school. Um, but they were kind of interested in everything. And um, I think they were both very keen uh, to see the kids go on and you know, get a good education and you know, pretty much do whatever we wanted. So when I started announcing, probably about 12 years old or so, that I thought it would be great to be an archaeologist, um, they were really very supportive about this. Although, again, your know, archaeology wasn't um, in either of their backgrounds or anything. They said, you go ahead and do it. They helped me find out how you get a career or, or not get a career uh, in this line of work. And, um, so it was all, all upheld from there. And, and what, was the, what, what was it about archaeology, you think, that attracted you, even as a young person? Well, this is something I remember very precisely <laughs> what it was with this. I was 10 years old, and um, my parents took uh, my sister, who was four years older than me, took my sister and me to go and see a new movie of the Railway Children, the Edith Nesbitt uh, classic from the early 20th century. Mm -hmm. And we went to see this movie, and it was great. I really liked it. But before the movie showed, they had a short feature based on Eric von Daniken's book, Chariots of the Gods, which had come out a couple of years before this, went on to sell, I'm told, 68 million copies but I mean, as I'm sure you know, the basic thrust of this book is that in ancient times, astronauts kept coming to Earth and visiting the Earth and stuff like uh, a lot of the Maya glyphs, um, according to von Daniken, showed Ma uh, alien spaceships coming to Earth. And the Nazca lines in Peru were alien landing um, strips for their spaceships. And the Hebrew Bible describes uh, the hmm. alien nuclear weapons being set off. And so anyway, they made this little movie about this and I thought this was great. And hmm. up till that evening, I'd been convinced I wanted to be an astronaut. I was you know, not phased by the fact that Britain didn't have a manned space program. That seemed like a minor detail. But after I saw this movie, I realized that archaeology was the way to go. And I plunged into this with enormous enthusiasm and, uh, and stuck with it. Mm -hmm. Interesting enough, and we'll talk about this later in the interview, it, you're, you're also looking to the future in that, That's right. in that, that little <laughs> anecdote, which is interesting. Now, in one of your bi biographies, I read after working in bakery, plastics, plants, and toilet factories, plus a spell as a guitarist in a heavy metal band, uh, Ian Morris went on to Cambridge. So we'll talk about <laughs> Cambridge in a minute. What, what did that experience in those different uh, uh, professions uh, uh, do for you? Well, I think um, you know, having to have jobs and make some money to, to keep body and soul together is a very good thing for everybody. And um, not everybody in the historical profession comes from uh, the sort of background where they, they have jobs like that. And I think it does shape the way you view the world a little bit. I think it does incline you to be more of a materialist when you're aware of the shortcomings of not having money to buy your food with. It really focuses your mind. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, being a guitarist in a heavy metal band, um, that <laughs> taught me to trust nobody, I guess, is uh, <laughs> uh, the, the main outcome of this. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, uh, and then you went on to, uh, to Cambridge and you, 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 you followed your passion. Yeah, I was an undergraduate at Birmingham University, first of all. And um, I went there, because in the British system, this was back in the late 1970s, in the British system, you would decide what you were going to major in before you went to college, and you went there and you, you just did that. And so I went to Birmingham in this very good program they had called Ancient History and Archaeology, where you, you, you focused initially on the whole world and then narrowed it down to a smaller area. And um, the thing was, by the time I went there, when I was 18, I'd kind of lost interest in the archaeology by that point, because I was in these heavy metal bands, and I was was much more interested in the kinds of things that most teenage boys are interested in. And studying and stuff really wasn't part of the plan. Um, and then as I reached the ripe old age of 20 and started to mature a little bit, 
I then realized that this actually, this ancient history stuff, this was kind of cool. This was a lot of fun. Um, I, I got some money from Birmingham to go and spend some time in Greece and Italy in the summer between my second and third year. So the third year was the final year in the British system. And I went out and I just had such a great time. And I thought, this is, this again, this is really cool. I could really like doing this. And uh, so my rock star career started to look like it wasn't panning out. And I thought, this, um, this ancient history thing, I think I'll stick with that. And then, because you, you get a little bit further along and you start to discover some of the practicalities of going into an academic career. And so I started a PhD at Birmingham, but then transferred to Cambridge because that was where the guy who was like the world authority in what I was interested in was at Cambridge. So I moved on there, and I think I was probably one of the only graduate students in the world who actually really liked graduate school. I had a blast. I mean, nobody told me what to do. I got paid enough to buy my food and my beer, and that was pretty much all I was worrying about at the point. So, uh, yeah, graduate school was good. <laughs> <laughs> and what did you do your dissertation on? Well, like most dissertations, it, you know, very narrowly defined topic. It was a, a very quantitative study of burials from Athens between about 1100 and 500 BC. And um, there was a, a lot of debate going on at that point about the origins of the Greek city-states and particularly where the uh, peculiar egalitarianism of Greek society came from and you know, why the Greeks developed something that um, we can meaningfully call democracy, whereas most ancient societies don't go anywhere near something like that. And um, there just wasn't a lot of evidence for this crucial period down to about 500. The, the written sources start around 700 BC with Homer and Hesiod. Mm -hmm. But before that, there's, you know, there's really nothing except archaeology. And uh, this was a very poor period in Greek history. And so most of what they built above ground was very easily destroyed by other ancient buildings. So it was basically burials on nothing at that point in the 1980s. So I did all this quantitative stuff with graphs and diagrams and convinced myself I had solved all the problems of the origins of Greek egalitarianism. And, and what was your insight in the in the dissertation? Well, um, I, I sort of came to it from the way a lot of prehistoric archaeologists working in other parts of the world were currently looking at burials. And they had gotten very interested in um, ideas about rite of passage rituals that anthropologists had been working on very much in the early 20th century. And so the basic idea they were playing around with was that when you bury a dead person, um, the funeral is a ritual that accomplishes all kinds of things. And a lot of the things that it accomplishes are very psychological, very connected to grief. But a lot of them are very sociological as well. Um, in particular, um, the thing that they tended to focus on was the way uh, like somebody dies, and this changes the world for all the people connected to that dead person. And you tend to get a ritual process that starts off by moving people out of the everyday state of life, saying you know, something has now happened, you have to do something, so maybe you'll don special clothes for mourning or eat special foods or whatever it might be. Then there'll be this liminal period um, where you're kind of out of the normal state of things, and then a closing ritual, a funeral, burying the dead person, um, which brings you back into the normal state of things again. And a lot of these rituals leave archaeological traces mm. behind them. And the idea was that by digging these up and understanding them properly, we can get a sense of what ancient people thought the ideal world actually looked like, what the order of society should be. So some people say get buried with spectacular grave gods and other people get nothing at all. That probably tells you a lot about a sense of hierarchy and difference within the society. If, on the other hand, everybody gets buried very similarly, um, that tells you something very different hmm. about the society. If the, the, the funerals seem to conflict with what we find when we dig up their houses, that tells you another set of things. So basically, I, I looked at the Greek material through this sort of lens and suggested that it was in the 8th century BC that we get this new idea emerging of a community of very equal male citizens. And this is the, the roots of later Greek democracy. Hmm. Fascinating. Now, at Stanford now, you are both a professor of uh, archaeology and a professor of history. I is there a natural fit between these two disciplines, uh, and, and how do they mm -hmm. complement each other? Yeah, it seems to me that archaeology and history are basically the same thing. That um, you, you've got to, you, you ought to have a discipline that is interested in understanding what people did in the past. And archaeology and history are slightly different versions of it. You use different kinds of evidence. Um, but it seems to me that's really all the difference that there should be. And I'm always constantly amazed at the gap that there 
often is between archaeologists and historians. They tend not to read each other's work, tend not to communicate all that much. Um, each tends to find members of the other profession just bewildering people. You know, why would somebody be interested in X rather than Y? And so I think there's a huge amount to be gained from just sitting in the middle ground between these two disciplines. Mm -hmm. Now, in, in somewhere in your book, you talk about having served as a dean and, and uh, in addition to all of the boring stuff, that's my <laughs> assertion, not, not necessarily yours, that, that you, you really got a sense of all the breakthroughs that were occurring both in the sciences, in the sciences and the social sciences uh, and, and uh, uh, the implications of that for your, your own work. Yes, yeah, the, the setup we have at Stanford is we have a single big school of humanities and sciences. It has a, a big dean running the whole show. And I wasn't the big dean, that's a much more difficult job. I was one of the associate deans that, uh, in theory, runs one part of the show. But in those days, all of the associate deans would all be involved in the appointments and the tenuring and the, the firing processes and so on. And yeah, I just found this very, very eye opening. Um, the, the sort of standards being applied and the way people were thinking about things in the natural sciences and some parts of the social sciences, of course, very, very different from what's normally done in the humanities. And uh, I guess, I mean, I, I felt I drew a number of conclusions from it. And one was about the differences between the different ways of thinking about the human condition. So it seems to me humanities and sciences, we are all involved in a single enterprise here. You're making sense of the world, basically. Um, but at the same time, I, I also thought there were a lot of basic similarities between the humanities and natural and social sciences. Um, I was very pleasantly surprised to discover that natural scientists seem to be just as confused as humanists and sort of basically making it up just as much of the time. It can, a similar sort of thing where you've got all these problems and you don't really have direct evidence that answers them. So you make something up and see how it flies. And uh, this was very liberating to see how many of the natural scientists did seem to me to be working down the same, um, same kind of path. But I thought one of the big differences was that the natural sciences, probably simply because of the nature of the material that you're working with, uh, they are much, much better at being able to explain what would count as falsifying an idea. And so it's not just a matter of telling another story and hoping it's a bit more, so at some gut level, a bit more convincing than the previous stories, the way I think it often is in the humanities. Uh, and people were much better at saying, if we find X in our subsequent experiments, I'll know I was wrong. And if I'm wrong, then either I'll have to fudge the data somehow, or I will have to tweak my theory a little bit, or just quit altogether and start over. And that, I think, was uh, you know, very, very helpful to have an opportunity to see how people actually work through this in practice. Mm -hmm. And, and what, what did you conclude and, and how how has it affected your work in this regard, namely breaking out of the silos? Because one of the, the problems of intellectual life at university is the fragmentation. Yes. The, yeah. As you dig deeper and deeper, you, you're gone down so far that, that you don't know what's on the horizon coming from other disciplines. Yeah, yeah, and of course we like these archaeological metaphors of the digging deeper and <laughs> getting <laughs> yeah, down into the bottom right. of your trench. Yeah. But yes, and I think yeah, I think everybody agrees on what the basic issues are. Of course, it, uh, if you don't have the people who dig deeper and deeper and deeper, you never really understand things properly. But on the other hand, if you don't have the people who sort of wander around very superficially up on the surface, um, you don't see where anything fits together. And I think you know, everybody agrees that uh, the ideal would be be some combination of the two. But I think there's a you know, huge disagreement on just what that combination would look like. And um, I get what well, we were talking a little bit before the show began about you know, personality types and different sorts of disciplines. And um, my major discipline where my appointment is, my main appointment at Stanford is in classics, which is a very dig deep kind of field. We've been doing this in a, uh, you know, clearly a modern form of classics for 250 years now, working on Greek and Roman literature. And people have dug about as deep as you can go. Um, mm. In fact, they had 150 years ago they already dug as deep as you can go in a lot of parts of the field um, and our field that field is very well designed for people who really really like to focus in on 
a, a solvable, very definable problem. And I found early on that that's not really me. Um, I'm a much more superficial person with a very short attention span and a much happier kind of wandering around. So the, this intersection of archaeology and history and classics and various other bits and pieces now, I think that, that just suits my temperament a lot better. And it, it may be that you know, my particular solution to the best balance of these things is one which just horrifies a lot of my colleagues. In fact, I know it is. Um, but I think you know, we need to have a lot of different kinds of people out there. Mm -hmm. and, and so how, how does this thinking affect your notions about how students should train in, in both archaeology and history? Because we'll mm -hmm. talk about your book in a minute, and it, it's, it's very interdisciplinary uh, in, in nature. Yeah, I think that the yeah, training of students thing is uh, is a big issue, and we again we all wrestle with this, and um, it comes up uh, you know, constantly for archaeologists because archaeology um, in the U.S. archaeology is not normally, of course, uh, taught in its own academic department in a university. It's normally split up um, between, you know, say, things like Greek and Roman stuff will be in the classics department, and Near Eastern might be in a you know, biblical studies or religious studies department. Um, East Asian might be in art history, and uh, American archaeology. Uh, will generally be in the anthropology department and, and a lot of other parts of the world as well. So it's very fragmented. And the idea is always that the archaeologists in this particular part of the world will um, fit into their host department. So the class of the Greco-Roman archaeologists will be able to talk about Plato and St. Augustine and you know, make jokes in Latin and all this kind of thing. And the people working in the New World should be able to sit down and have a perfectly sensible conversation with an ethnographer you know, who may be working on smoking in Milwaukee or something. They're supposed to be able to have a sensible conversation with that person. But at the same time, say an archaeologist working on the rise of the Maya city-states is supposed to be able to have a conversation with an archaeologist working on the rise of Italian city-states, say. So you're, you're always at this intersection between different sorts of communities. And there's a lot of different ideas about how best to solve it. And I mean, what we've done at Stanford with our archaeology setup is our graduate students come into particular departments like classics or anthropology. But then they also belong to an archaeology center which um, straddles the these different departments. And so they spend ideally about half their time in their departmental home and about half their time um, in uh, their interdepartmental center home. Um, and we found with archaeology this has been really quite successful. I think it's much more difficult to do with a really well-established discipline. It, you know, conventionally has its own quite big, well-funded departments like history or classics, say. Um, it's rather harder to sort of pop people out of that context into a bigger and sometimes rather bewildering kind of context. And often, of course, the rewards aren't really there early in your career um, for, for going out and doing this. I mean, like say if you're a historian and you know as much about the, the ancient Chinese Han dynasty as you do about the Roman Empire, it may be that Roman historians and Chinese historians both say, well, this is just a weird guy. This is not really one of us. Mm -hmm. So I, th yeah, I think it's a great challenge. I think, again, in principle, everybody kind of agrees what ought to be happening, but in practice, there's so much room for falling out that it, uh, for the, you know, the, the new people getting their PhDs, it's, it's a very risky business. So, so let's talk about uh, your book, why, and I'll show the, it again, Why the West Rules for Now. And uh, what, what, how long did it take you to write the book, and, and what was your overarching goal in doing that? Uh, I assume that you were drawing on some of this intellectual background that we just <laughs> talked about, uh, especially uh, this combination of archaeology and history. Yeah, um, I mean, I'd been interested in questions of this kind, of sort of the big macro historical questions, really ever since I started in the field. Uh, but I'd never really done very much about it. And I think a lot of, um, a lot of people are like that. You know, a lot of historians are very interested in broad questions. But uh, you know, professional pressures are such that most of the rewards flow to people who define rather narrow questions and answer them very successfully. So I'd ne kind of never really done um, very much about this. Uh, but then a, a number of sort of accidental things really. I think in the, uh, in the middle part of the last decade, it all came together around about 2005 or so. And one of them was just a series of discussions that we'd been having at Stanford um, in some big conferences we'd been running with historical sociologists in particular uh, about the larger directions of world history. And this had made me kind of reflect a lot more on uh, the assumptions that go on in my own home field of classics. Because yeah, here's this field where you look at Greek and Roman culture. This is basically your deal. And um, 
the, the field got to be a very big deal at the beginning, the end of the 18th, beginning of the 19th century. Um, basically, because people in Europe started to say that uh, Europeans are different from the rest of the world, different from and better than the rest of the world. And the major reason for this is that Europe has this background in Greece and Rome, which were unique cultures of creativity and um, dynamism and science and reason. And this has just made Europeans better than everybody else. And in the 19th century, this was a very powerful theory, very, very influential, which is why classics departments came, became so big. Um, as the 20th century went on, uh, academics started to retreat from this theory for all kinds of very, very obvious reasons. And by the late 20th century, it was almost impossible to find professional classicists who would say, we study Greece and Rome because they're better than everybody else, and they made us better too. Um, but the weird thing is, if we don't believe that anymore, we don't believe Greece and Rome are special in the whole history of the world, then why do we have such huge classics departments at, at uh, many, many universities? Uh, you know, almost every little college uh, across the country has one or two classicists. Places like Berkeley will have 20, 30, 40 people specializing in Greece and Rome. So, so why do we do this? And it seemed to me um, that the reason why we do this is this unstated, implicit counterfactual assumption that there really was something special about Greece and Rome. But it's something nobody in the field was really talking about. And so um, I thought for a long time, you know, this is something we really need to investigate, to take it seriously. Uh, and as I was having these conversations with the historical sociologists, I increasingly came to feel that a lot of the debates about why uh, Western Europe and North America came to such unprecedented global prominence in the last 200 years, a lot of these debates were really arguments about long-term history, about whether there was something in the distant past that had locked in this outcome, or whether it was a recent accident. And so I started to feel that somebody like me, interested in a, a very long-run history, might have something to contribute here. And then the, the final thing was a friend of mine um, had been very successful in writing trade books, and uh, she put me in touch with her literary agent, who is a very, very forceful, dynamic character. And once I'd mentioned this um, vague idea of a project to my agent, um, the next thing I knew I was writing the book. I, I have no recollection of how I actually decided I would do this. It was just sort of irresistible <laughs> so force swept me in this direction. Say. Yeah, I did. Yeah. And, and, and I, I want to emphasize two points that that, that it's, it's uh, uh, different in a way to talk about global history. I mean, there, there's more, more of that being done, but in this, in, in this earlier period that you were talking about, it was really national histories mm -hmm. or maybe regional histories yes. and so on. And then the other thing is, uh, I guess, from your experiences as a dean and, and from your reading, you, you were really looking for patterns so you're, you're also mm -hmm. grappling with the notion, well, if we go back in time, we're looking at global theory, you know, what, what is a, a theory that we might play with to figure out if it's correct about how uh, one part of the world comes to dominate another? Right, yes. Yeah, I mean, it seemed to me from my reading of the, the theorizing that's been done on this problem, um, the core issue was that uh, people have these wildly different theories about Western domination and it, the likelihood that it'll continue. The core issue was that a lot of the time, different groups of people would be looking at different kinds of evidence from different periods and places, defining the terms in different ways, having uh, completely different assumptions about what constituted uh, an adequate theory and what constituted falsification. And um, well, one of the things I say in my book is it, it reminded me very strongly of this you know, famous South Asian Indian story about the five blind men and the elephant. And, you know, one guy, they're asked what it is, and one guy grabs a tail and says it's a rope, and another guy grabs a tusk and says it's a spear, and they'll grab different bits and have very different ideas. And it seemed to me that what we really need here is some way to force people to step back a little bit and say, aha, it's an elephant. And then we can start arguing about why an elephant is the peculiar shape that it is. But until we decide what the shape of the historical patterns is, uh, we're never likely to have any kind of agreement on what's causing them. And people did disagree wildly over what the, the long run shape of the history was. And, and importantly, when you, when you uh, take this long view, you really go back in time. So the, 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 the first part of the book uh, really uh, looks at one of your variables, biology, mm -hmm. and ask, well, are people in different parts of the world really different, and how did they evolve over time? Uh, talk about that, because you're, you're pretty clear about the, what the answer is. <laughs> yes, yes. Because, uh, 
Back in the, in the 19th, early 20th centuries, a lot of the most popular theories said, well, Westerners are simply racially superior to everybody else. And end of story, nothing more to talk about. And of course, these theories are largely discredited in the academic world, um, but not completely. And um, certainly, uh, it's not too difficult to find people who in one way or another uh, hang on to some version of these theories. And in fact, in, um, in some parts of China, in some parts of Chinese academia, uh, uh, there's a very strongly held theory that uh, human beings in China evolved separately from the humans in Africa, and modern Chinese humans are genetically different from uh, modern humans in other parts of the world. So I think these are very, very important ideas to talk about. And I think the, the definitional issues, in fact, are, are one of the critical things, because often when people are talking about Western dominance in the world and uh, what is the West, they will start by saying, well, the West is a set of values that I happen to like. Uh, so it might be democracy, or it might be Christianity, or or all kinds of possibilities out there. And our job is to start when we can first identify this variable. So say in ancient Greece with democracy or um, in, uh, in Roman Palestine with Christianity and trace the story forward showing how this drove the whole thing. And it seemed to me that was just a kind of ludicrous way uh, to, to do the whole procedure. And of course, a lot of other historians have pointed this out before. So what I tried to do in the book was to start by um, going backwards and tell the story from its beginning rather than starting in the present and looking back for the origin point of a particular value. And so look back into the past and find the point at which you can first identify really strong, um, geographically distinct ways of life around the world. And uh, some um, prehistorians, some paleoanthropologists have suggested that we can actually see this emerging way, way back in prehistory, that as early as about 1.8 million years ago, we can start to see a divergence between uh, cultural and even biological evolution in the East and the West. And there's numerous other points after this as well. And so, uh, yeah, the first chapter of the book um, goes through this story in as much detail as I could squeeze into that many pages. And it was a lot of fun writing. I, I learned a huge amount. And I also learned learned that it must be a lot of fun to be a paleoanthropologist. The story, <laughs> it changes so fast. I had a great crisis um, after the book had gone off to be published and had to claw back the proofs and make a big change because up till last spring, um, nearly everybody agreed that modern humans have no Neanderthal DNA in their bodies. Then abruptly, they all turned around and said, no, in fact, we do have Neanderthal DNA in our bodies. And uh, in the end, it turned out that didn't make a huge difference to the argument I was making, but it was something that really had to be in the book. And so, yeah, it's an exciting field. Now, now, it, and it, what, what's interesting here is you're you're drawing on the insights you derive from actually being a, an administrator who saw all of the the breakthroughs and so on. And I guess in the end, what 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 I drew from this is that that all humans are alike, and and there there is a, an adaptive quality that actually runs through the whole book. You know, man's ability to be presented with a man or woman mm -hmm. with a, a, a situation and, and try to uh, think their way out of it. Yeah, I, I came to the conclusion, um, as I was writing the book, this came to clearer to me as the process went on, that. Uh, there are really three things we need to know about in order to answer this why the West rules question. And one of them, like you're saying, is biology. Uh, the, the, the genetics and the archaeology seem to be pretty conclusive at this point, that human beings are pretty much all the same, that we are all fundamentally descended from people who evolved in uh, Africa between 150,000 and 200,000 years ago. People are much the same everywhere. I mean, obviously, you can take any two human beings and find that they're wildly different from each other. But people in large groups, you take a million people from Europe and a million people from China, you're going to have roughly the same set of characteristics within those two sets of a million people. Uh, the second thing that struck me very much was a kind of sociological generalization. That it seems to me that um, human societies have evolved or developed, whatever word you want to use, along very, very similar paths. Uh, we've never had hunter-gatherers leaping to the space age. You always go through the same set of stages, if you want to put it that way. Uh, and you put those two together and you get a kind of socio-biological theory, uh, if you like, that applies to you know, all human beings in all times and places. And I realized that the thing that makes for the differences, you know, why 
societies in some parts of the world have changed so much faster than those in other parts of the world really was the geography. Um, you know, much as a biologist might say it's the ecological niche which makes the, the major difference to why certain mutations flourish in one place, not another. It's the same with humans. We're all animals, we're clever chimpanzees, we're all pretty much the same. Our societies develop pretty much the same way. It's the geography that makes the difference. Not great men, not religion, not culture, not bungling idiots, geography. Mm -hmm. And and so let, let, let's uh, let's break this down. And 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 uh, uh, one very interesting point that you made that that is now becoming obvious. But uh, when we were growing up, it, it wasn't so obvious. And that is the notion that over and over again, the triumphs of Western culture turn out to have been local versions of broader trends, not lonely beacons in a general darkness. Uh, if we think about culture, and, and you, you're really saying in a broader sense, when you have breakthroughs like Christianity uh, in the West, mm -hmm. then when you do global history and you relativize the, the experience of the West, you find similar things going on in different parts of the world. Talk a little about that, because that's, that's very important. I mean, we increasingly yeah. understand this as the world becomes multicultural, but 25, 30 years ago, this wasn't something generally thought yes. about. Yeah, no, I think, uh, as you say, there is a general movement towards seeing things this way. And this is something that, uh, you yeah, know, there's a, a lot more world historians now than there were 25, 30 years ago. This is the sort of point that, on the whole, the world historians are very, very keen on making. And yeah, I mean, when I started teaching, my first um, proposition was at the University of Chicago. We had there this very famous undergraduate sequence, a history of Western civilization, which I taught in for several years. I taught the whole sequence from ancient Greece through to the fall of communism. And I, I love of doing it. It was an absolute blast. But um, it now seems like a really peculiar, surreal kind of course. We just looked at these, uh, what was supposed to be uh, the great monuments of, of Western literature and thinking in complete isolation from the rest of the world. And uh, as soon as you step back from the details and take a much longer term perspective, a much broader view, it does become glaringly obvious how much of what was happening in Western Eurasia was part of these larger um, transitions going on all across Eurasia. And um, I suggest in, in my book that what you get is people are responding to the kind of questions that um, geography and social development are thrusting onto their societies. And so like in the, the first millennium BC, around the middle of that millennium, you get a wave of new kinds of thought all the way from the Mediterranean to China. You get uh, characters like uh, Plato and Socrates in the Mediterranean, or uh, say the Hebrew Bible prophets uh, in Israel, and um, the Buddha and uh, the early Jainists in India, and Confucius and Mozze out in China. You know, all of these guys, are, you know, all of their ideas are quite different, but they're all wrestling with the same basic problems about how an individual can transcend this world and uh, come to a deeper understanding of the cosmos and a better place in the universe. And they've all got different techniques for doing it, but they're all wrestling with the same kind of problems. And then about a thousand years later, uh, at the time of, say, the fall of the Roman Empire in the western end of Eurasia, the collapse of the Han Dynasty in um, eastern Eurasia, you get a, a roughly simultaneous shift to another set of problems. People start saying, well, all this stuff uh, from a thousand years ago, Plato and all these guys, telling me how to comport myself and think and understand the workings of the cosmos, I don't really care about that anymore. What I care about now, and this world that seems to be falling to pieces, what I care about now is individual salvation. How will I go on from all this chaos and disaster? How can I be sure that God or the gods love me? And this is the world in which Christianity in Western Eurasia and Mahayana Buddhism in Eastern Asia become these enormous enormous successes, winning tens of millions of converts. And some people would look at Islam as being part of the same, uh, same general trend. And again, you know, tens of millions of converts. And I think you, you can go through a lot of what in high school we were taught about as the turning points in Western Civ, like the Renaissance and the Reformation, and see how how striking it is, uh, how, how similar the intellectual trends are over very large areas. So yeah, this is a really, uh, for, for me writing this book, this is just an amazing discovery to, to get into. Help us, uh, uh, our audience, understand the, this importance of geography. So, so, so 
what, what we're, uh, th this, we've talked about biology, uh, we'll talk on, in a minute about social development, but it, with regard to geography, where you mm -hmm. wind up really matters as the climate changes, it, it presents opportunities uh, for people who are situated in a particular place. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you say, like, like I do, that geography has driven social development, geography explains why the West rules, um, this you know, it's a nice, simple theory. And you can say it in sort of one page or so and get the whole problem solved. And the, the problem, of course, is that historical reality is this extremely messy business, uh, as we all know, constantly just stuff happening all the time. Um, it's not immediately obvious that it makes sense to say that geography explains everything. And um, I guess, again, this is something that uh, uh, my thinking changed significantly while I was writing the book and things became a lot clearer to me. And it dawned on me that geography uh, is the driving force in this story, but it's geography in a slightly complicated sense because uh, it's like geography is kind of a two-way street. On the one side, you've got the fact that geography constrains societies, geography forces problems onto groups of people. And in that sense, geography drives social development. But the other side of the street is that um, changing social development simultaneously changes what the geography means. Uh, and this is you know, one reason why the book's quite a long book. Uh, in order to demonstrate this claim, what I have to do then is, of course, go through the story, looking at all these episodes like the Renaissance and so on, where people will point to some totally different factor, like great geniuses, say that's what changed history, and show that, no, in fact, it really really wasn't like that. The, the great men were, were just a proximate cause of the outcome. The ultimate cause was this back and forth interaction between um, underlying geography, physical geography, and the organization of societies which changes what geography means. Mm -hmm. and, and so, for example, in, in, in initially uh, when farming begins, certain uh, places uh, have a natural advantage. Yes. And, and the men and women adapt to that. But later, uh, we, we go forward hundreds of years and we discover that was, what was a disadvantage for the British uh, mm -hmm. because they were an island uh, close to uh, North America suddenly becomes an advantage. Uh, originally, it was a disadvantage because they weren't near the farming areas. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, for most of human history, growing up in Britain like I did was just a really bad mm -hmm. idea. Uh, you, were, you were stuck out into the North Atlantic Ocean. It's wet, it's cold, and it's kind of dismal. And you're a very long way from the centers of action in Western Eurasia, down in the Mediterranean Basin, um, what we now call Southwest Asia. And this, uh, this remained true really up till about the last 500 years. And about five 500 years ago, uh, a series of technological developments originally pioneered in East Asia um, spreads quickly across the whole Eurasian landmass all the way out to the backward fringe in uh, Northwest Europe. And in particular, I'm thinking of ocean-going ships and guns, um, because the ocean-going ships, of course, as the name suggests, allow you to cross over oceans. Guns allow you to shoot the people who live on the other side. Um, these things, everybody thinks these are swell inventions and loves them. But um, when these guns invented in East Asia, they push social development in a way that abruptly changes the meanings of geography. As, um, Northwest Europe has been 3,000 miles from the Americas ever since the continent stopped moving. And China has been about six or 7,000 miles, as you would have to sail in a sailing ship to get to the Americas, ever since the continent stopped moving. And these have been facts of geography, but they just haven't been very important. If you can't cross the oceans, America may as well be on the moon. It just doesn't matter. Then the minute you start getting these ships that can cross the oceans, all of a sudden, this geography becomes the most important fact in the world. And um, Northwest Europeans are uh, sail to the Americas before East Asians do simply because they're twice as close. And I argue at some length in the book that other things being equal, East Asians would have discovered the Americas sooner or later. And East Asians would have shown up there. East Asians had just as nasty germs as West Europeans did. They would have breathed these on the natives and wiped out the vast bulk of the population. They would have colonized the New World, plundered its wealth, and begun to develop much larger, more complicated economic systems. But other things were not equal. Geography 
geography meant that it was just much, much easier for Europeans to do this than East Asians. There were a lot more incentives for Europeans to do it as well, driven by the geography. And I, I suggest in my book that this is really what tips things toward the western end of Eurasia very, very dramatically at, at that point. Um, that it's really the new meanings of geography that push Europeans into a scientific revolution, enlightenment, ultimately an industrial revolution, and then projecting power globally. And, and you were grappling in the book with, with what are the measures of social development that, that uh, uh, help us understand why certain peoples move ahead as they confront these uh, new uh, problems and opportunities mm -hmm. of geography. Yeah, yeah. I mean, now this is the, the the five blind men and the elephant problem again. I was talking about mm -hmm. earlier. Uh, what we really need, I think, to answer a question like this, is some way to make things explicit. And uh, not necessarily, you don't need to claim that you're making everything more objective, but you do need to be more explicit about things. And um, you know, perhaps because of the kinds of intellectual backgrounds I've come from, it has always seemed to me that the best way to do this is to quantify something. And again, you know, my, my quantification of social development may be completely insane. But because I've quantified it, I've been forced to explain exactly how I'm thinking about things, why I say the answer to this is 43 rather than 47. And somebody else can come along and say, yeah, this makes no sense. It really is 47, not 43. And just gets everything out in the open. So the, like the, the backbone running through my book, in a way, is this quantification of social development, particularly the eastern and western ends of Eurasia. And I think that it really does make, I mean, if I I've done it correctly, it really does make a lot of things clear. Mm -hmm. Like one of the big arguments has always been that the West has just always been um, more advanced, more developed than the East. Uh, another big argument has been that no, East and West, the similarities vastly outweigh the differences up till say 200 years ago when some weird accident happens and catapults the West into global domination. And if either of those theories is true, this should be visible in these graphs of social development. And in fact, it's not. Um, the picture is really a, a little bit more complicated than that in all kinds of interesting ways. And so I think the, the great thing about quantifying social development over uh, uh, 16 thousand year period like I do, is that this, this doesn't answer the question. It doesn't explain why the West rules, but it does show you what you need to be able to explain to have a proper answer. So yeah, the quantification thing is very important. And, and your variables that you're playing with uh, are energy capture, organization, war making, information technology. That's right. Yeah, I uh, took the, my inspiration for actually doing this from the United Nations Human Development Index. I call mine the Social Development Index, just to you know, make that clear. And uh, this, I think, uh, the Human Development Index has come in for all kinds of criticism, all kinds of people. But it is a very, very useful thing. And people do make a lot of very um, productive use out of it. And what the UN uh, decided to do is they said, we want a simple measure which would allow us to compare how well governments around the world are doing it, um, providing conditions so that their citizens can realize their innate human potential. So they ask themselves, what do we need to measure? And we want to come up with the smallest number of traits we can look at to avoid it just you know, proliferating wildly. The smallest number of traits we can look at, which actually covers the whole range of what we mean by human development. So they came up with three traits, which are what is it, life expectancy, um, real wages, and uh, years of education. And they said that's more or less covers what we're interested in. And so I tried to do the same thing um, for social development over this 16,000 year period since the, the last stage of the Ice Age. And of course, I, I needed different variables to look at. I, I ended up with four traits rather than three. I needed to cover the whole range of social development, by which I basically mean the ability of societies to, to get things done in the world and you know, impose their wills on their environments. Um, and uh, also for my index, what makes it a little bit trickier, I think, than the Human Development Index, is I need to be able to do this over a 16,000-year period. So they have to be things that you really can, within certain limits, measure. And so I spent quite a lot of time on this. And last summer, I ended up writing a whole new book, which is available on my website as a free download, uh, just called Social Development, a 75,000-word book. And I explain exactly how I, I do all of this. And I, again, I'm sure probably nobody in the entire world will agree with me completely on every claim that I make in this. But I'm hoping it does at least push us toward being a bit more explicit about what we're doing. Now, if we go back to your early years, 
uh, you saw this film and there were digs, but there, were, there was also uh, a concern with the spaceships landing <laughs> in, this, in this ancient time. So, so where you take all of this is to speculate about the future. Uh, so so you, you want to use history and archaeology to predict where we might be going. So you, you, you've grappled with this, why the West seemed to win mm -hmm. for a time. Well, you say that uh, for now. And then you're, you're trying to anticipate where the world is going. Let, let's really talk about that. Uh, and, and where does that lead you uh, in, in answering the question, uh, how will we deal with all these global problems? Who will be up? Who will be down? So yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess um, I tend to feel that uh, you know, history is kind of the worst guide to what's going to happen in the future, except for all the other guides. And so, I mean, I, I don't really come down with a single firm prediction about, you know, this is what's going to happen over the next century. But I do think that uh, in, in two ways, looking back at the long run of history um, can at least allow us to map out what the main issues are going to be in the 21st century. And the, the two things I mean by this are uh, what I think the long long-run historian can do is you can identify the trends that have unfolded across thousands of years. You can see, um, I mean, I really do believe this, you back up far enough, you can see the forces that have driven human history. Uh, but at the same time, when you back up and look over the very long run, you also see that oh, uh, constantly these trends have tended to generate the very forces that go on to undermine them. So it's like there's a constant sort of pushback or sort of dialectical process, if you want to dignify it with a fancy name, going on throughout history. And there is no reason to think that either the trends that have driven history or the kinds of forces that they generate that then undermine them. No reason to think that either of these are miraculously going to stop um, in the year 2010. And so um, in the last chapter of the book, I try to do two things at once. One is look at where these trends might be taking us. The other is to look at the forces that they generate that undermine them. And I think one aspect of where they're taking us I think is pretty clear, that uh, if you just um, project forward across the next century, the rates of change in social development that we saw in the 20th century, the um, Eastern score steadily gains on the West. And so I come down with, I thought, a marvelously precise prediction in my book that in the, the year 2103, Eastern social development will catch up with Western, which is, of course, an absolutely insane prediction. Um, and uh, for reasons I, I talk about a little bit in the book, I, I think it does, though, suggest that that's probably the other things being equal, that is the latest point at which we can expect Eastern and Western social development to converge. We're probably talking about the second half of this century for the convergence. But what we also see when we play around with these, these lines drawn through history and project them forward into the future, not only is it the convergence of these lines, but also just how high these scores, the social development scores, are going to rise if current trends continue. And so like, um, from between the end of the Ice Age and the year 2000, um, social development scores rose on my index by about 900 points in this 16,000 year period. If 20th century trends continue, they're going to rise by another 4,000 points by the times the lines cross. And um, sort of oversimplifying rather dramatically, but one way to think about that is to say that the amount of social change between the cave painters at Chauvet or Altamira and us is one quarter of the amount of social change we should expect to see between now and the year 2110, which suggests that the year 2110 is going to be utterly unlike anything we can begin to imagine. And I talk a bit in my book about some of the uh, the more sort of spaceship oriented um, uh, predictions that have been made by different specialists in this area and about you know, what this scale on change on this scale might mean. So that's kind of one side of it. The other side is looking at the forces that undermine these um, trends. And, and the first you call singularity. That's right. Uh, yes. And the second Nightfall. Nightfall. Yeah, I take the name the singularity from um, you know, the very influential writings of Ray Kurzweil, a Bay Area inventor and futurist. And his big um, shtick is that the big change we're going to see in the 21st century is a merging of biological and machine-based intelligence. And I think there are enough very clear signs of this already being underway and the pace of it accelerating that we do have to take this very seriously. I think this is one of the logical predictions you can make on the basis of the the, the 
trends of the fairly recent past sort of attached onto the longer term pictures. The second name, Nightfall, um, if we don't get, I suggest in my book, if we don't end up with some kind of singularity, we're going to end up in something uh, that I call Nightfall. I take this uh, name from Isaac Asimov, the wonderful science fiction story writer. And Asimov wrote a story called Nightfall, published it back in 1941. It's several times been voted the best science fiction story ever written. And the, the idea here is this, this planet called Lagash, which has multiple suns. And so on Lagash, it's always daylight, except for once every almost 10,000 years, all of the suns line up right behind each other, at just the right moment for the one moon of Lagash to pass in front of them. And night falls, a total eclipse, night falls, the stars come out. And everybody goes mad because they've never seen anything like this. They burn their civilization down completely, destroy it totally, and have to start rebuilding it all from the ground back up again. And um, throughout the book, I look at examples of great disasters in history and constantly say, yeah, there's never been a nightfall. We've ne you never, ever get to turn the clock back. But in the 21st century, we do have the option of turning the clock back. And we have had, in fact, increasingly since 1945. And the, the big variable we've got now, which was never there in earlier times, is nuclear weapons. And you know, even if um, Congress does see its way to ratifying the most recent round of nuclear weapons reductions, uh, we're still going to have enough left to kill everybody multiple times over. And so um, I, in the last chapter of the book, I look at the kinds of forces that threaten moves toward a singularity and note that on the whole, they're exactly the same sets of forces we've seen over and over again in history, involving things like uncontrollable mass migration, state failure, large-scale famines, um, epidemic diseases, and climate change is always in the mix uh, somewhere when we see a, a great social collapse. And these, of course, are forces we can see very, very very clearly emerging in our own day. So in some ways, I suggest the 21st century will be much like periods like, say, the later Roman Empire or the fall of the Han Dynasty or the era of perhaps the Black Death in Eurasia. In other ways, though, utterly different because now nightfall really is on the table. Mm -hmm. And, and you're, you're, uh, uh, you're suggesting that the possibility for mankind and womankind is, is actually uh, to transcend biology, transcend geography, uh, but on the other hand, in, the, in this this contradiction is that that we could also uh, uh, see a world that doesn't recognize and doesn't have the institutions to deal with all these problems, which are really global problems. Yes, I think uh, this is, again is a, a wonderful example of the way social development changes the meaning of geography. That, um, over the last 150, 200 years, um, the, the, the pace of integration of the world has accelerated ju just spectacularly. And um, of course, you know, at one point, the Atlantic Ocean was this huge impassable barrier. In the 19th century, the steamships really shrank the Atlantic Ocean dramatically. Railroads shrank the huge spaces of North America. In the 20th century, we've seen the same kind of thing happening uh, to the Pacific Ocean and East Asia, which is the, the, one of the major reasons, I think, that we're seeing this rapid catch up of Eastern social social development in the later 20th century. And these forces, I think, are, are just accelerating. And um, if they continue at the sort of rate we've been seeing in the last 150 years, geography 100 years from now is just going to be an utterly different beast from what we're used to. And in fact, it may well get to the point where geography, physical space, really cease to mean very much at all in the world. And uh, this, again, I think is very tightly linked to some of these arguments about the transformation of human biology. You know, if the way some people suggest we're moving toward conditions where humans and machines are increasingly merged, then um, old biological conceptions of what space means are you know, almost certainly going to cease to be very relevant in this kind of world. So I, yeah, the book, I think there's this kind of irony to this, which again only struck me as I was writing the book. Um, by the end of the, the writing process, I had come to the feeling that once we have worked out why it is that the West dominates the planet, why the West rules, uh, and have understood these long-term historical patterns, then we're in a position to project these forward and see why this is just for now. 
But the problem is once we see that it's just for now, and once we understand what's likely to happen, the scale of change in the 21st century, then the initial question of why the West rules begins to lose some of its significance. I mean, I think 100 years from now, somebody writing a book like this one called Why the West Rules, uh, for now, this would seem about as silly as if I'd written this book about Anglo-German naval rivalry or something. It would just, you know, just seem like a laughably out-of-date kind of problem. You know, if our um, improved machine-based cells still write history books this is of course so so you're you're you've always had this uh, commitment to the humanities and uh, I'm, I'm just sort of curious what we're left with in w with regard to your view of uh, whether uh, we will adapt to these problems and or whether these singular changes will make us less than human. Uh, a guiding uh, point in your book is from uh, the science fiction writer Robert Hylan, and you quote him as saying, change is caused by lazy, greedy, frightened people who rarely know what they're doing, looking for easier, more profitable, and safer way to do things. So, so in the end, it, it's, a, it's a moderately cynical view, but with hope uh, that, that essentially this principle that you propose in the book, namely adaptation, will occur. Yeah, I, I guess it's a very biological view of history. And it does seem to me that history is really a subfield of biology. And in fact, all of the humanities are a subfield of biology. Mm -hmm. They're about the, um, the doings of one particular animal species. And if we were looking at bunny rabbits rather than humans, we'd have no hesitation in saying yeah, the study of, well, in fact, as we do with chimpanzees, we have no hesitation in saying the study of chimpanzee culture is a subfield of biology. And I think the same is broadly true of human beings. Uh, it's, just that, of course, what humans do is so special and, and fascinating. So we tend to think of it as an entirely different way of looking at the world. I really don't think it is. Um, I also think another consequence of thinking about human history somewhat more biologically is um, you know, before we get the evolution of fully modern humans, there's nothing you can really call culture or cultural evolution going on with other species of somewhat human creatures or other kinds of animals. When human beings as we're used to them are no longer around in this sort of form, which I think is virtually inevitable, virtually every species has already gone extinct. So this is, is almost inevitable, humans will change into something else. Um, when that happens, the humanities will be a part of a kind of historical, the historical biology, evolutionary biology. And uh, they will remain important, I think, but I think they're going to become increasingly grounded in, in biological approaches to human beings. Mm -hmm. So, so what are the implications for policy uh, of your study? I mean, we're always grappling with this mm -hmm. notion of, oh, our policy makers should really know more history. Yeah, well, not surprisingly, I agree <laughs> completely <laughs> with this. And history is a very, very good thing to know about. And uh, yeah, we, we rarely go around saying, oh boy, I wish that before invading such and such a country, our leaders had known a bit less history. I mean, we rarely say that. And so, yeah, the, the implications that come out of my book, I mean, uh, the one that struck me most while I was writing it was one I hadn't thought about as much as I should have done before I started, which is that the real issue, I think, still remains nuclear weapons. That um, Global warming is, of course, a massive issue that has to be confronted and dealt with uh, in some way. But by itself, again, if other things were equal, which is an impossible thing to claim in human dealings, if other things were equal, um, global warming is not going to wipe humanity off the map. What conceivably could wipe humanity off the map is the way that people react to global warming. And in particular, of course, the impact of global warming varies wildly around the globe. And uh, a strategy people often like to talk about uh, what they call an arc of instability, stretching up from Central Africa, curving through the Middle East, out into Central East Asia, where uh, we've got a lot of the world's poorest people living there. Um, the world's most vulnerable water supplies are concentrated in this area. Um, a lot of the natural resources that the great powers still depend on are concentrated in this area. A lot of the world's most shaky political regimes are here, and nuclear proliferation seems to be working fastest in this area. And I would say that the implication of looking at long-term history is that we should worry most about conflicts in this area driven 
probably in large part by global warming uh, as a root cause. Conflicts in this area spiraling out of control, drawing in great powers that feel that their vital interests are at stake here, and mushrooming into nuclear war of the kind that we had hoped had gone away after 1989. But it may turn out that we've been living in this little golden age. And this, I think, is the, the most terrifying thing. One, one final question. Our time is running out, but, but how do you think students should prepare for the future in light of, of the arguments you're making? Well, um, I think that some education in history is a very good thing, some education in economics, some education in biology. All of these, I think, are, are very good things. Um, in my experience with our undergraduates, particularly at Stanford, is that um, students are thinking a lot about the future these days. I think we come out of a period when there was a certain amount of complacency, in a sense, of, yay, everything is great, we won the Cold War, we know how the world is going. I mean, students wouldn't normally say that we've seen the end of history, but that, I think, was the kind of assumption. Uh, that, that was being made. Now I don't think students are feeling that way at all. So I think uh, you know, there's some reasons to be optimistic that the energy is there and the commitment, the recognition uh, that the problems we're facing are increasingly global scale problems, whereas our institutions unfortunately are still mostly locked in the age of, of nation states. So I think there's a great deal of enthusiasm and optimism among students. Well, on that, that note, uh, uh, Ian, I want to thank you for being here. I'm going to show your book again, and uh, we, uh, you can't do, one can't do justice to the book in an hour, and, and I do want to emphasize that there are parts of this book that read like a novel. <laughs> so you're a great storyteller, thank a social you. scientist, uh, and a futurologist who, <laughs> who really realized that uh, dream that inspired you when you were a young person and watch that <laughs> film. Thank you for being on our program. Well, thank you for having me on the show. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.